Thank you. Good evening, young friends and students, and welcome to the 11th episode of All India Postgraduate Teaching Program, which is a new initiative from ARC AIOS. This is a PG program with difference, which, uh, which is trying to cover the uncovered aspects of teaching programs like case presentations, journal clubs, OSCEs, and didactics on topics which are not comprehensively available in textbook at a single point. The last episode for us was a journal club which had a viewership of more than 2,460. Facebook 900 to be precise, YouTube 1300 and web, uh, we had 260 people who attended last episode of a journal club. So here we present today students, our 11th episode of the series, which is a didactic lecture on recent advances in orbital implant, which has been asked as a long question in MSDNB finals. Today's didactic lecture would be therefore presented by Professor Dr. Varsha Bakivat, who is a head of the Department of Orbit and Oculoplasty at Shankanetrale, Chennai. My special thanks goes to Dr. Rajesh Choudhury, who is a consultant ophthalmic surgeon, oculoplastic, lacrimal, orbital, and cataract services at Fortis Group of Hospital, Kolkata. And Dr. Sujitra Haridas, who is Professor, Department of Ophthalmology at Amrita Institute of Medical Sciences, Kochi. And I'm really thankful to them for sparing time and consenting to be a discussion for this important topic. Now I request Dr. Varsha to share her screen and continue. And I would request Dr. Rajesh and Dr. Uh, Sujitra ma'am then for after the talk to have a discussion at the level for our postgraduates. So over to you, Dr. Varsha. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Am I audible? Yes. Please. You can share your screen. Yeah. Okay. Is it visible? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Great. Okay. Thank you very much. At the outset, I'd like to thank Dr. Prashant and the entire organizing committee for uh, inviting me for this uh, wonderful talk. Uh, so I'll be talking today about orbital implants. So today uh, I'll be discussing a little bit of the basics of implants and then we'll go into the recent advances of orbital implants. So what is an implant per se? So an implant is a medical device which is manufactured to replace a missing biological structure or to support a damaged biological structure or to enhance an existing biological structure. So this is basically the definition of an implant. So orbital implants can be either implants in anophthalmic sockets to replace the lost volume or fracture implants. So we'll be discussing both today. So uh, it starts in 1583 with extirpation of the eyes to till today where we have much more recent advances. Uh, so uh, as we all know, uh, the globe volume, 90% of it is reached by seven years and 70% of the adult volume is reached by four years of age. So an ideal implant would be something which is non-degradable, biocompatible, non-allergic, non-toxic, no foreign body reaction, easily sterilizable and economic in nature. So it can range in the past from gold spheres to current implants where we have uh, uh, various recent advances, which we'll be discussing later. So uh, in general, the average size that we implant in an adult would be about 20 to 22 millimeter size of an implant. So if we do an evisceration, we would minus two mm from it, and then we would uh, put the appropriate size of implant. So the size is quite important because if we put a smaller implant, it can displace, migrate, or cause superior cellular deformity can be there. Whereas if you put a larger implant, there will be wound gape and implant exposure. So we have to put an ideal sized implants. So in order to uh, be aware of all the different types of implants, we'll go into the classification of implants where we can classify it as non-porous and porous and they can be classified further into integrated, non-integrated and quasi-integrated. Then we have bio-integrated and biogenic implants. So I'd be just mentioning a little bit of that 
each feature, the basic features of each one, and then we'll go into the recent advance of each implant type. So this is non-integrated where the prosthesis and the implant is not integrated at all. All right. So now this is an integrated implant, whereas the prosthesis is integrated to the implant below through a pegging. As you can see, there is a small uh, device here in the center, which is called as a peg. And here we have a quasi-integrated implant, wherein the implant is modified in such a way that it's sitting very well with the prosthesis, integrating in a way. So this is quasi-integrated. Now, non-porous implants, you all know that it is it can be PMMA or silicon. Silicon is not favored because uh, it causes a fibrous tissue reaction, encapsulation, and infection. And PMMA is a popular non-porous implant. It is easy to use, good clinical outcomes, low cost, and both implants have no fibrovascular ingrowth whatsoever. So these are non-porous implants. Now, uh, in, we have like implants such as Allen, Iowa, and universal implants, which are not in vogue now, but the idea behind it has been used in the recent implants. So Allen implant is basically a lock and key coupling support system. And Iowa is wherein there are four peripheral moles and channels wherein we can suture and universal has smaller moles. So then we have the gastrovagal implant, which is a smooth convex pivotal surface and a central depression with four bridges, wherein the four recti muscles can be sutured. And there's a half implant, which is a unique two-piece design, which originated in Pakistan. So this is about the basic non-porous implants. Now, porous implants, when you talk about porous implants, it can be hydroxyapatite, porous polyethylene and aluminum oxide. So as the name suggests, a porous implant basically helps in fibrovascular in growth and therefore the migration does not occur and it is nicely placed in the socket. Uh, hydroxyapatite, it's basically a complex calcium phosphate which is similar to human bony tissue and uh, the, the plus side of it is the fibrovascular in growth. But what are the cons of this implant? It needs to be wrapped because it has a very rough surface and so it can cause exposure and conjunctival um, thinning and uh, exposure of the implant. Um, now, types of hydroxyapatite implants. So initially they started off with bovine hydroxyapatite implants, which was known as the molchinosphere. Then they came up with the coralline hydroxyapatite uh, implants. So as you know, the ecosystem, the marine ecosystem is very valuable for us. So there was a controversy in that. And therefore the Coraline Bio-I, the hydroxyapatite implant was then replaced by synthetic hydroxyapatite implants. Now that was the second type of porous implants. Then we have the porous polyethylene, which is a metpore implant, which is uh, quite commonly used more in the West, less so in uh, India. And uh, it is biocompatible. It has a fibrovascular in growth and the surface can be made smoother. So the abrasion over the conjunctiva can be less. It is pliable and any shape can be made. Like it can be spherical, egg-shaped, conical or mounted. So the Medpore implants underwent a lot of variations. So one is the Medpore Plus implant, which is a bioactive glass coated uh, implant of the Medpore implant, which is called as a Medpore Plus. And there are these Medpore quad motility implants, like I already mentioned before, like similar to the idea of Iowa Universal, this porous polyethylene implant is made into that shape. So this is like a quasi-integrated implant, a porous one. And then came the uh, smooth surface tunnel spheres, which are again a porous implants, which has four tunnels through which the erectile muscles can be sutured. And we have a Medpore Plus with a smooth surface tunnel sphere. So these are the modifications of the recent advances in the porous implants. So now further, there is the conical orbital implant where it is made in the shape of a cone. So the posterior portion of the COI projects into the conal apex. So the overall volume is about the spherical implant with the 2 mm larger diameter. 
So next is the aluminum oxide material, which is again porous and biceramic and inert. It has very rapid and uh, complete fibrovascularization. Its advantage over the other implants are that it is it's light and it has a smoother surface and less abrasive. So now coming to the composite implant. So we discussed about each type of material, porous, non-porous, and now they came up with the idea of combining these materials. So initially they came up with proplast and one and proplast two, which was Teflon carbon and Teflon alumina. Then later we came come up with better composite implants. One is the Guthoff et al. implant, where it had a anterior hydroxy appetite and posterior silicon. So there is fibrovascular ingrowth as well as has the properties of the non-porous implants. Then came the Metport Plus implants, which like I mentioned before, it is a porous polyethylene implant with bioglass, which is a more of a recent one. And there is the Duret implant, which is anterior porous PFMA with the posterior silicon. So these are the composite implants, which you can mention uh, for the decent uh, advances and also the expandable hydrogel implants. Now, hydrogel implants are again in vogue in many uh, places, and this is a meta, meta acrylate plus uh, N vinyl pyrolidode uh, material. These are spheres or hemispheres. They are injected, they are available in the form of pellets, and they are injected into the socket, and it swells up to 12 times. So, there is an effect for nearly about six months. There are different volumes available, depending on how much volume you want to inject, depending, it's usually recommended in children where we want to expand the socket. It stimulates the orbital growth and the volume can be titrated depending upon how much volume you want to give to the child. Uh, and uh, this is uh, one which could be useful, especially in children with anophthalmic sockets come, uh, since birth. So uh, wherein we really cannot keep on doing surgeries again and again to expand the volume. So this hydrogel expandable implants is very useful. Now, again, this is again a hydrogel implant, the alpha sphere. The advantage is basically it is pliable and direct suturing of extraocular movements. Muscles can be done and it does not need a wrapping and has less exposure in the smooth surface. The disadvantage mainly was a disintegration and fragmentation, and therefore this was not used, though this is a recent one. So now magnetic implants, just to mention, they, these were in vogue in the past, and nowadays it is not in vogue because of the drawback of iron toxicity and movement with MRI. However, these magnetic implants are useful in eccentration socket, which we will not be covering today. So now further recent advances would be porous silicon implants, and bioglass and biosilicate, which is capable of binding to hard and soft tissue. So these are uh, recently into vogue and they have uh, some good results in the literature. So now the next generation implants, these implants are have been, uh, um, I mean, experimented in animals, which are not exactly used in humans currently, but these are the next generation implants where alumina implants can be coated with a thin layer of hydroxy appetite or it can be hydroxy appetite can be coated with collagen or heparin or multilayers or fibrogen growth, fibroblast growth factors. So these are basically to increase the vascularity of the uh, va fibrovascular ingrowth. So just to mention about uh, pegging, which is not again widely done in India, but abroad there are uh, doctors who advocate this, where the prosthesis is connected to the implant and usually the titanium is used and about it's usually done about six to 12 months after the implantation. It's inserted within a sleeve that is drilled into the anterior aspect of the implant. So, but however, this has its own complications like chronic discharge, implant infection, exposure, this increased cost, and it requires a second surgery. So, uh, this is not advocated by uh, many surgeons, but there are people who prefer this. Now, when we have porous implants, especially, we would prefer to wrap it up with either a sclera, or facial lata, or temporalis fascia, or pericardium. Now, we can use even synthetic materials to wrap the implant, say, Vicryl, or a Gore-Tex, or a PTFE sheet, which can be used. So now, when we talk about complications, you can have these complications like infection, granuloma, exposure, extrusion, migration, thinning of the conjunctiva. 
uh, cyst formation, encapsulation, socket contracture, and expansion. Now, going on to the next segment wherein we'll be discussing about the fracture implants. So, it, this can be basically autologous and alloplastic. So, in autologous implants, you can have bone, cartilage, facial ata, or periosteal. So, in bone, you can have a cancellous bone, membranous bone, nasal septa, conchal, or rib. So, this is the autologous implants. So, and in the classification of alloplastic implants, you have non resorbable and resorbable implants. So, resorbable implants are the newer implants, which you will need to mention. And non resorbable implants are non metallic, metallic, or composite. So in non-metallic, we have the porous and non-porous, just like how we discussed in the socket implants. And metallic, we have the titanium implants, which is used widely by most surgeons. And then we have the composite implants, which carries the benefits of the porous implants as well as the uh, metallic implants. Um, so just to mention a few things about what are the different types, and then we'll go on to the recent advances, just like how we discussed in the socket implants. So in non-porous implants can be of different materials, which can be silicon, nylon, dacron, or teflon. But the, the three below are not in, used. In the past, silicon used to be used. But the main disadvantage is encapsulation, infection. So that also is not used anymore. So these are just non-metallic, non-porous, non-metallic implants. Then we have the non-metallic porous implants. This is quite widely used by everyone. It is so adequate. It has adequate tensile strength. And for small to medium fractures, we can use this. It is easily contoured, stable, and flexible. It has a decreased operative time, and it allows fibrovascular ingrowth. Also, it is available in varying thickness, depending on how you want to place it. And we can use this non-metallic porous polyethylene implants. The only downside to this implant is that it needs a good posterior support. You need to have a good support. So we cannot use this in large fractures. It has a lower tensile strength and, the, uh, and memory compared to titanium. So in metallic implants, like we, as I've already mentioned, it is titanium implant, which is used now in the past. They started off with stainless steel and vitalium, which is not used anymore. And titanium has replaced all of them. It is least corrosive. It has a ten, uh, tensile strength like vitalium. It is uh, malleable. And uh, uh, however, it can have a orbital fibrosis syndrome where the adherence of tissue to the titanium implant can occur. So that is one of the possible complications that you can have in titanium implants. So titanium implants are available in various forms like pre-contoured implants. So, uh, and they can be used in uh, larger fractures and it has a good memory, resist deformation and uh, it is non-resorbable. So these are just a few pictures wherein the patients have undergone uh, titanium implants and they're doing well. So now we studied the uh, plus as of the porous implants and the metallic implants. So then why not combine the two? So we have composite implants here as well. So the which carries the advantages of titanium as well as the porous polyethylene material. So the titanium provides the better contouring and shaping, better memory, better tensile strength, which is used in large fractures. Whereas the porous polyethylene part of it provides the fibrovascularization, stabilization, and the protection from the orbital adherence syndrome. Like I already mentioned, titanium implants, you can have orbital adherence syndrome where the soft tissue, um, the lid, the soft tissues can get adhered along with the titanium material. So this can be prevented because the porous polyethylene is covering over the titanium uh, material. So we have the Medport Titan implants. These are these implants. So we have two types, basically the channel implants and the titanium barrier implants. These are the two types of composite implants. So the channel implants are porous poly polyethylene sheets that require titanium micro or mini plates for fixation to the bone. Whereas the titanium barrier, as you can see, there are two sheets of porous polyethylene and within it, you have the titanium mesh. So this barrier is there. Uh, above and below the titanium mesh. That is why the name uh, has ca come up as titanium barrier implant. 
Now coming to absorbable implants. These are the reason implants. Basically, they are polymers of uh, polyglycolic acid PGA or PLLA or PLDA. So these are the absorbable implants and we have polycaprolactone. So these are the newer uh, absorbable implants. So when do we use these absorbable implants? It is more uh, in, uh, in vogue for children. So we can use ab absorbable implants in children because we don't have to remove the titanium metal implants later as the orbit grows. And so we have the absorbable implants. So the lactosorb, the commercially we call it as lactosorb, which is PLLA with PGA. And then we have Polymax rapid sorb, which are uh, PLLA uh, and uh, uh, DL uh, copolymers, which has a ratio of 70 is to 30. And then we have 85 is to 15 ratio. So these are the av available absorbable implants. Then osteomesh is now used more commonly. We use this implant, which is made up of polycaprolactone. So why use absorbable implant? What is the advantage of uh, over the titanium and porous implants? Now, the best thing about it, it is that it is comparable to autologous implants. And like, as you all know, autologous material is the gold standard almost always. However, you have a, a large donor site morbidity and you need uh, different surgical skill to get an autologous implant uh, uh, for the uh, fracture repair. So this absorbable implants, it has adequate tensile strength for small to medium fractures. And it retains the strength for quite a few weeks, like six to eight weeks. And then the polymer resorbs in like six to 12 months with new bone formation. So the polymer will resorb and then new bone will be forming. And they have minimal inflammatory reaction. So there is no donor site morbidity. And it is especially advocated in children because we want new bone formation and we don't have to go in to remove the um, implant which we have placed. So the disadvantage of absorbable implants is that it cannot be used in all fractures. So suppose we have a very large fracture, these absorbable implants are not going to be useful. And the optimum rate as to when it is going to resorb, we, we cannot really see. Now, next in vogue is the patient-specific implants. What are patient-specific implants? Is basically they are customized implants to the patient, uh, depending on what type of fracture they have and how much of support is available in that sort of fracture. So usually we have been using more commonly the pre-contoured ready-made implants. So in most fractures, we are able to use the pre-contoured ready-made implants. But in some fractures, we may not be able to place a pre-contoured ready-made implant wherein there is no adequate posterior support or there may not be a proper rim where we can uh, screw the implant. So in these situations, we use the computer-assisted 3D printed implants. So uh, these are the patient-specific implants wherein uh, we mirror the normal orbit and we create an implant. So the other thing is that we can even pre-bend the pre-contoured implant. So you can take an STL model, a stereolithographic STL model of the patient's uh, orbit and then we can place the pre-contoured implant and then we can bend it and uh, see how the ready-made implant is placed and then we can go ahead with implanting it. And if you want to make a brand new 3D printed implant also is possible. So the basic steps of a PSI would be first is to generate a virtual 3D image, which is usually done uh, in the DICOM format. And we mirror the normal site and we superimpose the mirror object on the affected site. And then we will have to create the patient specific implants. And usually it will ask for three landmarks, which we have to uh, or uh, signify and then we create the patient specific implants. So what are the implant materials in patient specific implants? What we are usually using is titanium and nowadays we are using polyether ether ketone peak implants and porous polyethylene. So depending on the uh, damage which is caused by the trauma, depending on the size of the fracture and everything, we can um, make a patient specific customized implant. So these are examples wherein you have a titanium implant, which is an PSI, and then here we have a peak implant, which is again a PSI. So the conclusion to this thing would be one should be have a thorough knowledge of the various implant characteristics 
so uh, to uh, you know in order to know which implant would suit each patient we should be aware of the strengths and the weaknesses of each implant and whatever said and done we should do a case based selection of the implants depending on uh, how is the fracture is what is the size of the fracture which implant would be choose for this patient depending on the age of the patient and everything and of course the cost also so psi implants are definitely costlier than the other uh, ready made implants so we need to be aware of the latest technologies which are available so we can implement it in our practice and get the best outcome for the patients i'd like to acknowledge all my colleagues and uh, thank you again for the wonderful uh, opportunity yeah, I... thank you dr varsha for wonderfully uh, simplifying the such a complex topic it's such a elaborate topic and i mean taking 25 minutes within that you read it now i would request dr rajesh as well as sujitra ma'am to carry forward the discussion for you yes varsha it's a very wonderful presentation and it is complete and it very useful for all pgs and i would like to add uh, one point here usually when they start writing the exam they have to write the indication for implant then uh, each implant specific in pediatric age group which is preferable and about few points about dernis fat graft can you please highlight that yeah yes ma'am so dermis fat graft is basically um, so like when we assess a patient a socket when we assess it there are two things that we look at one is the volume and the other is the surface so volume and surface replacement so especially in children uh, we uh, opt for dermis fat graft for two reasons one is that the fat keeps growing along with the child so we don't have to exchange the implants if you're going to do it at an earlier on age and also it gives additional surface to the child so most of the children would be probably uh, post retinoblastoma post enucleation so they might have have a surface contracture already underlying so then these patients we can give a uh, put a dfg uh the uh, that is one thing so it's basically volume and surface and it is an autologous implant so that is thick so it's it's more so used in children but we do use it in adults also where the patient has volume and surface deficit so if there is simply a volume deficit we would prefer a ball implant with whatever material you want to do it uh, and then if there is additional surface we either have to do a ball implant and then a mucous membrane graft or we can go ahead with a dermis fat graft directly i see a question in the chat box which says how early should an implant be done in a inflated eyeball uh, in a, that's what the question is saying okay in a inflated it should be done in the same sitting usually so we can usually we opt for a pmma implant so it says basically in a post inflated eye that patient comes to you that is the okay. stage when in a pediatric case of or you would like to specify further about it in a pediatric case how early can so, it should be in a later age group how late you can be um so initially it suppose depends on the age at which they present suppose they present at about uh, so usually we try to avoid any form of surgery up to about 3 years if they have not already if you are going to take up the child as enucleation and in the same sitting then we put the implant so suppose we are seeing the child about at 1 year of age the first thing that we need to do is to put a shell or a conformer or a button conformer wherein we try to expand the socket so the other thing is like i mentioned the hydrogel implant so it will keep expanding the socket so over a period of time so after the child reaches a particular age then we can do a ball implant so that is the thing so usually we try to avoid surgery up to 3 years but having said that when there is a socket contracture say there is the bony orbit is becoming smaller or there is already a little bit of uh, soft tissue contracture we have to put an implant as early as possible this so uh, it depends on uh, uh, the age of the presentation and how the volume and the surface is for the child so we can put a prosthesis in the beginning but will will require an implant definitely in the course of time very good presentation uh, dr varsha thank uh, you it is nice to see you again 
um you know as you know i think it was absolutely perfect but you made it more perfect by talking about the dermo fat graft because i think that is an area which is very important for a lot of you know re reasons um one of the important uh, aspect of you know for our students that uh, as uh, dr prashant was saying that why do we need to do uh, these implants i think these questions they need to be quite aware of obviously you know one reason and uh, obviously we have to replace the globe volume replacement and cosmetic aspects as well so these are the things which are very vital for a surgeon whenever he's uh, looking into uh, this kind of implants and um, as you got correctly correctly mentioned that uh, for the patient specific implants uh, the newer uh, materials which are being used, especially the polyether, ether ketone, the peak implants, I think they're going to have a very important role in the future because hopefully the 3D uh, printed implants will get cheaper as time goes by because already I find quite a few of my maxillofacial colleagues are using these implants and they do have an important role to play. But obviously one has to remember that the old implants that which you have been used, so-called old implants, you know, tartan implants, they've done very well for us so far. And, you know, we have got very good result, all of us doing these implants. So yes, technology is important, but we also have to remember why we are doing what we are doing. We should not be carried away by the new technology. We should uh, assess each patient individually and do what is best for that patient. Uh, a 3D implant probably will be more suitable in a case where there is a complex fracture, where, you know, there is a large fracture and where, you know, you find that just the standardized titan implants, which are available from various companies, may not give you the most perfect result. In those kind of cases, maybe we should think about, you know, taking the help of the new, new technology like 3D printing and patient-specific implants. But uh, otherwise... You know, in about our country where health expenses are quite detrimental to the economical well-being of our families, we have to remember that that is a fact we have to keep in mind as well. Uh, so I think, you know, that's very vital to understand. There is a question in the chat box. In a orbital fractures, what is the indication of surgery? When should it be operated? When it should be done conservative? That's what I probably says, the student says. Uh, any one of you, Dr. Rajesh or Dr. Sujit Well, Ramad? you know, orbital fracture, obviously, you know, we have to assess the patient and find out what exactly is happening. In a orbital fracture, I presume the student probably means an orbital fracture, a simple orbital fracture without involving the rim of the orbit without any complex fascia or, you know, other facial fracture. If there is a... Uh, complicated fracture where other parts of the uh, orbitofacial area is involved as well, then the surgery needs to be done pretty quickly because otherwise there can be other you know, complications as well. For the orbital fracture as such, if there is a muscle entrapment, if there is a large fracture where you are, there is an enophthalmus, more than two millimeter, and if there is a, a damage to any kind of you know, vital structure inside the orbit, then the need for our uh, surgery is paramount. However, if you find that there is minimal displacement, there is no soft tissue entrapment, and uh, in that kind of cases, and the vision is fine as well, you can wait and watch, and these patients will do very well without any intervention. Dr. Suchitra, you may add something if you want to. Uh, if in, in fracture, with, when there is muscle entrapment and if there is vasovagal, that is heart rate going down, that is an emergency situation. We have to intervene. And if there is my minimal fracture without any displacement or entrapment of orbital tissue, we can wait. That's what I want to add. Are you doing any patient-specific implants in Chennai now, SN now, uh, Dr. Varsha? Yes, sir, we do. 
uh, PSIs, like you rightly mentioned, most of our cases we go in for pre-contoured implants mm -hmm. only. If there is a small posterior strut, we are able to manage. But in the patients where the we don't have a posterior strut to place most often, those are the patients we ask for uh, a PSI. So we have our uh, Dr. Anand sir is associated oh, with yes. us. And he helps us. He's very keen care. about good technology, new technology, isn't he? Yes, yes. You know, I had the fortune, good fortune of working with him when I was in uh, Essen as well. And he would come over to, you know, Kolkata and help. Okay. So he's nice. very good that way. Yes. So uh, not everybody can afford the PSI. And mm. most of the patients, like you rightly said, sir, they get away with the pre-contoured uh, implants. There mm. are a few patients who really require the PSIs. Mm. So, yeah. It's important to, you know, assess the patients. I think we cannot emphasize enough the need for, you know, clinical skills, talking to the patients, assessing the patients, you know, assessing the clinical signs and symptoms. These are very vital. It's sometimes very easy to get lost in the, you know, newer technology and, you know, lose uh, touch with what we need to do, actually, which is, you know, checking the patient properly, checking the history properly and finding out what are the signs and symptoms and not just treat the you know scan maybe sometimes we are very prone to do that isn't it yes. so the other thing what i wanted to add a bit about the indications are uh, a special mention to like ma'am had already mentioned the white eye blow up fracture so in other words where in children especially they can go into a bradycardia when the muscle is entrapped so they need to be taken up very early whereas in adults we usually prefer to do at around 10 to 14 days when the inflammation is a bit reduced and then we take up for the fracture so the entrapment, why should we go in and release the entrapped muscle is because if it's stuck there within the uh, over there, then it can undergo fibrosis, necrosis, the vascular supply can go off. So we need to intervene so that we uh, provide uh, good function to the extraocular muscle. So the need for intervention is essential in those cases, like it's already been uh, mentioned. Yeah. There is a question for you. Uh, one of you can answer. Uh, if it is a uh, wound rip, I mean, it says if there is a globe rupture associated with orbital fractures, how should we pro proceed? Yes, so the primary importance is a very important question and this has to be followed everywhere. So the first thing is to go and do the globe repair. So that would be the first thing. If in case we do it vice versa or together, sometimes when we do the orbital fracture repair, we will be using a lot of retractures, a lot of traction and a pressure. So then you can actually extrude the contents of the eye outside. So which is detrimental for vision and they can be, uh, you know, it will land up in a blind eye. So it has happened. A few cases have been operated. Uh, you know, the fracture has been repaired. The globe uh, rupture has been missed. So it is always very essential to look for the globe integrity. Uh, when there is a lot of lid edema, many of us, many times, it is difficult to assess the lid. So it is very important to put in a speculum and see how the globe is under general anesthesia if, if it is needed. And then that has to be done first. So suppose we do a globe repair. So we usually wait for about four weeks to four to six weeks. Afterwards, we will do the fracture repair. So because in the immediate post-op period also, the sutures are all there and the globe integrity is it's not healed fully. So we wait for the healing to occur. And once the globe is stable, and then only we go in for the orbital fracture repair. If it's only going to be like the, the rim or the zygoma, where sometimes they can have difficulty in opening the mouth, the zygomatic arch problem that they can undergo, that is not an issue, but the orbital fracture should be done only after the globe repair is done. And that is to after four to six weeks. Totally agree with uh, Dr. Varsha. I have seen cases where people have come to us with chemical injuries of the face and the eyes, and somehow the eye injury was totally ignored. So this patient had not just, you know, a uh, uh, I think we're talking about a physical injury, but they also sometimes can be a situation when the chemical injury can cause a corneal um, damage. And that was ignored. And as a result, while looking after the face the during the procedure itself, 
I have seen that patient uh, doctors have managed to perforate the globe by putting pressure in the periocular area. So very vital that in any case with any injuries sort of, of the face and the eyes, one must put a speculum and look into the integrity of the eye and the cornea. One more question is there, I see, I, I get a question. It says, Madam, can you elaborate on how and uh, 3D printing uh, you construct the globe and the size of the globe, I believe, it means orbit, uh, orbital implant, he says, I believe. Uh, the, for the globe, we don't use 3D uh, printing uh, technique. We, this thing, that's basically for the fractures. Fracture. So for the fracture, we use that. So in this situation, basically, you'll have to mirror the other orbit. So the normal orbit, if we have one, and then that is mirrored. And then we, it, the, it's basically like uh, we'll have to enter, enter all the details into the computer. Then the, uh, we'll have to mirror the normal orbit. And then we have to select a few landmark locations wherein you want to place the implant. Because like I already mentioned, if it's a large fracture, you won't have the usual support. So you will have to find the support where all you want to do it. And then we go ahead making the model. Sir, so you would, um, um, would you like to add anything on the PSI? Um, I think you're, you're absolutely right, uh, Varsha, what you said, that um, this is basically looking into the, uh, the healthy side, which is, you know, the unfractured area and mirroring that. And uh, sometimes also, apart from making the implant itself, Sometimes, you know, uh, I've seen patients who have uh, taken an, uh, a model of the eye. They, print, they have actually uh, taken the model of the uh, fractured eye, the uh, orbital floor fracture, and they have used the pre-contoured uh, implant to try and see what kind of, you know, uh, maneuverability or manipulation you need to do when you are putting the implant. The reason this has been happening because obviously, you know, a lot of people initially did not have 3D printers which would print titanium, you know, uh, objects. So they didn't have metal 3D printers, but they had other material which would, you know, give them an idea about the shape of the orbit. So I know I don't know whether I'm clear enough. It's basically you are taking the you know scan of the orbit and depending on that you are printing out the uh, orbit itself you know in, in in a 3D format so that like when you have a 3D scan of the CT scan you are having a uh, 3D orbital uh, uh, implant printed out which is the injured orbit and you use the pre-contoured uh, titanium implant to fit into that uh, 3D printed implant and see what kind of implant will you need to use to fit best for the patient. So you choose the implant before the surgery. So it is uh, like planning before procedure. Planning, exactly. Planning. And it uh, reduces the surgical time. Correct. Yes. Otherwise, Correct. you have to implant, take out, contour it, recontour it. Mm -hmm. So here you know where exactly to fix it and what's the size. Absolutely. And Absolutely. Absolutely. I think we had a great discussion, and I'm sure we have exhausted the questions which have been asked to me on my mobile. So the thing is, I believe it has been quite uh, elaborate, quite lucid a talk from Dr. Varsha. And Absolutely. of course, you people have complimented Dr. Sujitra and Dr. Yourself, you have complimented so well. I think the questions have uh, been well answered. Uh, if there are no questions and answers, any further discussions, I think we can definitely then call it a... Hmm? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Thank Varsha. You. Thank, Thank you, Dr. Rajesh. Thank you very Dr. much. Dr. Thank you. Great to be here. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you for seriously. having us. Uh, I'm seriously thankful to you for finding time for my younger generations who are going to be the future in whose hands and orbit we will be, our <laughs> eyes and uh, orbits we might have to place in future. So I'm really thankful to you, Thank all you. three of you, on behalf of all my students who follow us on this particular program. And... Uh,
special thanks to all of you once more so it's time for us to say bye bye thank you uh, thank you so much bye. proud bye. of you dr varsha thank you thank you thank you very much bye bye dr suchitra bye bye